for those who are joining us on our live stream today. The old saying is that the camera adds 10 pounds uh, to those who are on your screen. And I'm not overly worried about that, but what I can tell you is that the humidity in Lincoln, Nebraska adds 10 pounds to your hair. <laughs> so, uh, so do not freak out. Um, I'm not a mutant. It's just growing since, you know, I'm getting out of the shower today. Um, and now no one will pay attention to the message at all. And you're just going to stare at it. I'm like a troll doll today. Remember on the pencils? Anyway, that's, that's what's happening in my brain today. Well, I want to uh, continue this series today. Uh, required courses, hard stuff of life that we don't like, but that we got to go through so we can get through the next step in life. And today... I want to talk about a subject that all of us, every one of us, no matter where you come from, no matter how young or how old you are, every one of us has experienced this issue in life. And so I want to start with a pop quiz. All right, class, you ready? Here we go. What is the very first thing in Scripture that God says is not good? The very first thing in Scripture that God says is not good. Say, say, you got to talk because this is the beginning of the sermon. If we don't get past this, we can't get to step two. All right. So, what's the very first thing that God says in Scripture that is not good? Don't overthink this. This is creation story. Not good for man to be alone. Ladies and gentlemen, Deb has permission now to go into my office after service. Get in the candy jar <laughs> my desk, and help yourself because you should all thank them too. So very good, very good. But yes, God said in scripture, he created all the things, right? He created the birds, he created the fish, the sky, the sun, the stars, the moon, all the stuff. And God kind of, if, the way, this is how my brain works, this is what I picture. God just kind of kicks back and is like, oh, that's good. Right? That's good. He did something amazing. It was it was perfect. It was just the way he designed it. And and he created man. He created man. And he's like, mm, it's not good for man to be alone. And today I, I, I want to try to make a distinction for us. Because for some of us, as soon as we hear alone, we kind of, if we're honest, we might get a little sad. Because some of us might be physically alone. In life, uh, especially uh, those who have lost a spouse, right? I, I, I say this not from my own experience, my personal experience, but from my mother, right? My mother and I have conversations all the time. My father just passed away uh, two years ago, and my mother is still going, it's weird being in the house alone, right? And so God told us it's not good for man to be alone. Which implies that, that he has something that he thinks is better. Why are we gathering together as God's people? Because it's not good for us to be alone, right? It's part of the, the community, the connection that we all long for, and that we all want, and we all desire, and we all need. Why has COVID been so difficult for us as people? It's because it has separated us and not allow us to have the connections that we are not only used to, but that we desire and need. And so when we see that idea that God said right from the very beginning, it's not good for man to be alone, that means every body who is created in the image of God, which in case you're wondering, that means everyone, past, present, future, all created in the image of God, that means that there is a deep longing and a desire for connection inside each one of us. It doesn't make it wrong when you are dealing with a sense of loneliness. That is God-given, okay? You're not a failure. You're not a terrible friend. You're, you're, you're not somebody that nobody wants to be around. That, that loneliness that you might be experiencing inside from time to time is God-given 
because he had relationship in mind from the very beginning. Connection, community, it's all part of God's design. And so I want to talk today not about being lonely, because we all have moments where we are physically lonely, being alone. I want to make a distinction today as we talk about this required course of loneliness. Okay? There is a distinction between being lonely and loneliness. Now here's the thing. When you try to look up in a dictionary, you can use all different kinds. Dictionaries are so helpful to us to understand the depth of what a word really means. Did you know that some dictionaries don't do such a good job of that? <laughs> One dictionary that I had looked up for the definition of loneliness said, the state of being alone. <laughs> well, gee, thanks, right? So, I have two other, if you want to call them definitions, of loneliness that I want us to think about today because it's kind of the foundation of this whole piece. So as we're talking about loneliness, this is what loneliness means. Les Carter wrote a book called Mind Over Emotions and he described loneliness this way. Loneliness is a feeling. I'm going to stop right there. Don't you hate pastors do that? You're like, man, it's three sentences long and he stopped at word four. Um, but loneliness is a feeling it's not the physical state of being lonely or alone. Loneliness is a feeling. It's internal. It's an emotion. It's a feeling of separation, isolation, or distance in human relations. Loneliness implies emotional pain, an empty feeling, and a yearning to feel understood and accepted by someone. And as we think about that definition, that picture of what loneliness really is, each one of us can insert ourselves in there somewhere. We've all experienced true loneliness. Another definition I want us to look at is from Tim Hansel, his book called Through the Wilderness of Loneliness. He said, loneliness is not the same as being alone. Loneliness is feeling alone. No matter how many people are around you. It's a feeling of being disconnected, unplugged, left out, isolated. And since we all experience loneliness, we got to figure out why and what are we going to do about it and all that kind of stuff. Because you know, as well as I do, that in those moments of loneliness, if we don't find a way to move forward in it, loneliness is the feeling and the emotion that just keeps going in the circle. But the circle gets bigger the longer it goes. You start here going, you know, I'm feeling kind of lonely. And you dwell on it and you sit in it and it doesn't get remedied and it just keeps getting bigger. And the more you think about being lonely and the more you feel lonely, the worse it gets. And so today I want us to look at a few things and a few examples of scripture of, of loneliness so that we can arrive on the other side of it, knowing that there is hope. And that there is a way out. But it's going to require some gut checking on our part. All right? And so there was a woman. I don't recall her name. I was talking to Jennifer last night. Trying, you know, I'm one of those people that if I just talk it out loud enough, eventually it will pull the file cabinet drawer out and remind me. It didn't. So I don't remember her name. But this woman was a, uh, she, was a she was a dear, saintly, older woman in the life of, of the church. And she led women's ministry pretty much her whole adult life. That's just what, what God had called her to. And one of the ways that she had talked about loneliness that stuck in my brain is she said there were three causes, three causes for loneliness. And I want to use those three causes today to help us understand a little bit about loneliness. And she said the first cause of loneliness was separation from God. Separation from God. And if today you are experiencing loneliness, um, and, or, or if this message is already causing you to be uh, nervous or uneasy, um, or going, oh man, I, I, I would have thought I'd known this is what he was preaching on, I'd have stayed. I want you to know you're in good company today. If 
you're experiencing loneliness even in this moment, you are with brothers and sisters who love you and are rowing the same boat. And we're going to look at a text right now that shows us even Jesus experienced loneliness. And this idea of separation from God, we can see in Matthew chapter 27, verse 46. This is, this is uh, when Jesus is being crucified. Okay? So Jesus is literally hanging on the cross at this point in this text. And Jesus, right before he passes away, before he officially dies on that cross, he cries out in a loud voice. It says, Eli, Eli, lema sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? In that moment, Jesus, the one and only Son of God, the perfect spotless Lamb, the one who did no wrong, also experienced the very same things you and I do. In that moment, Jesus learned what loneliness really was because for the very first time, he was separated from his heavenly Father. Why? Because the sin of the world was upon his shoulders. My sin, your sin, everyone's sin ever is resting upon Jesus. And the God that we serve our Heavenly Father is a holy God. And a holy God hates sin, can't even look upon sin. And Jesus is carrying it all. Separation from God. I'm going to ask a question this morning of us, all of us. Is it possible that there's sin in your life? that is separating you from God, bringing about these feelings of loneliness because you're separated from Him. Now, before we go any further, I, ha I have to say this to you today. That question is not a question or a statement of condemnation. That is not me as your pastor standing up here going, okay, where are all the sinners at? That's, that's not what we're doing here. So please, if, especially if, you, if this season of your life, you're really having a battle with loneliness, know that we are not condemning you for that. This is not a, well, it's all your fault type of a thing. We're not saying that. But we are going to be honest with each other and with ourselves. If there's loneliness, we're experiencing separation somehow. And so if we're feeling separated from God, could it be that there's unconfessed, unrepented sin in our lives that is currently creating a gap between us and our Lord? Something that we all have to think about and pray about. It's a, it's a gut check for each one of us. Because get this, Scripture tells us that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. I'll raise you to be front in the line of that. Okay? All have sinned. Each one of us have sinned. None of us are perfect. And that sin in our life is the same as the sin that was upon Jesus' shoulders. Jesus does not, cannot look upon the sin. Oh, he can forgive the sin, though. Be encouraged by that. If there is sin in your life, again, it's not condemnation. It's an opportunity to be set free. To have the chains of bondage released from your life and to turn away from the things that are entangling you and tripping you up. Jesus says, I'll clean that right up. No matter what you've done, no matter who you are, no matter where you have been, I can cleanse from all unrighteousness. But we have to confess it. We have to recognize it because we don't want to be separated from God. Here's the other thing about sin i got to mention real quick. That word is not really used a whole lot anymore. Even in the life of the church. Because 
well-meaning church people over the years have used the, the word sin so hatefully and so uh, derogatory and so just accusatory in ways that we turn the people off and nobody wants to hear us anymore. It was condemnation. In fact, for a lot of us, you can imagine in your mind's eye the, the old guy who is standing on a street corner or a milk crate with a megaphone and just yelling at all the sinners walking down the street, right? But here's the thing about the word sin. It's left a bad taste in people's mouth, but sin is still sin, okay? It's still something that God does not favor and look upon. It's still sin. But get this, the word sin, when you look at where we get our word sin from, the word for sin is an archery term. And it means to miss the mark. So if in your mind, if you can picture a target with a bullseye on it, and pulling that arrow back and letting it go, but if you're like me, you missed. Right? Missing the mark. Don't, don't hear the word sin more hatefully than it was ever intended to be heard. God still hates sin, but we're talking about missing the mark. We all miss the mark and fall short of the glory of God. Right? All of us do. So as we think about this idea of sin, where are you missing the mark in your life? Maybe you're like me, and when you start to have those feelings of loneliness, that stirring down deep in your gut or maybe in your chest, and you're like, man, something's just off. I was with people all day, and yet there was no connection. I felt like I was in a room by myself. I don't remember half the things that were talked about. Right? I have those moments, and I can look back, if I'm honest, and go, you know what? Those feelings of loneliness started to creep in when my connection with God began to walk off. My time in the Word began to wane a little bit. Right? I, I was so busy in my, my work, or I was so busy with my kids' schedules, or I was so busy with anything that, man, I just didn't make as much time for Jesus as I should have been. And so Jesus and I didn't spend as much time together in prayer. We didn't spend as much time together in the Word where He could meet me there. I wasn't spending time serving the church and serving my community. Because I'm convinced, church, by the way, that you want to meet Jesus, go work with Him where He already is. I'm going to let that hang so you catch that. Jesus is already on O Street. Jesus is already downtown. We're going to go join him in what he's doing. And when we do, our connection with him just grows exponentially. Right? But if I'm not doing those things, I'm not connected to God like I should be. I'm missing the mark, and I begin to experience loneliness there. Here's the other separation. This, uh, this lady that I can't remember her name. How's that? I remember Prince was once the artist formerly known as Prince. This will be the lady that I once remember her name. Separation from others is another cause of loneliness, she stated. Separation from others. It is almost a natural tendency for each one of us when we begin to experience loneliness to pull away from people. We may not even do it intentionally. It just kind of happens. Next thing you know, Less and less people are around you. Less and less conversations with friends begin to, to take place. And it's this idea of separation from others. Now, I want to show you a verse that messed me up because I had never looked at it in the way I'm about to share with you today before. Matthew 26, verse 40. Jesus, this is before the crucifixion takes place, this is Jesus going to the garden with a few of his disciples, and, and, and Jesus is going there to pray because he knows what's coming. He knows the beatings and the crucifixion and all that goes with that are on their way. In fact, Judas, the one who was to betray him, does it right after this passage we're looking at today. 
So he was in the garden praying, had a few of his closest disciples with him. And the text says, then he, being Jesus, he returned to his disciples and found them sleeping. Couldn't you men keep watch with me for one hour? He asked Peter. Jesus was alone physically because he left the group, went off by himself to go pray. The alone part isn't the issue. The loneliness is the issue. And I have always heard this text. I grew up in the church, and if I had written them all down, I had probably heard 417 sermons on this. Every time I've ever heard it, every time I've ever preached it, even if it's just in my Bible, my personal Bible reading, when I get to this verse, I read it as though Jesus is a little ticked off because these guys fell asleep, right? In fact, some of you have actually heard that as the, as the pastor's reading the text, and, and they're saying, and Jesus said, couldn't you men keep watch with me for one hour? You ever heard it that way before? Maybe it's just me. I don't know. Maybe I had some pastors who need to get saved. I don't know. But anyway, I didn't, I, in the preparation for this message, I didn't hear that as though Jesus was angry and, or, or that Jesus was chastising the disciples for, for falling asleep. I wonder, I just wonder if it's possible that in this text, in that simple question that Jesus was asking these disciples, is it possible that he was communicating to them the inward loneliness that he was experiencing because there was a separation being created right here. Yes, physically separated until he came back to the group, but the inward loneliness, separation, separation from others. Meaning, these are the people, these guys were his closest Friends, if anybody did life with Jesus, it's these guys. They're supposed to be there. They're supposed to have his back. The people who are there physically, but really not there at all in the grand scheme of things. Are they there relationally? Are they there emotionally? Are they there spiritually? They fall asleep. And even though they're present, not really there. And so Jesus, as he comes back and, and sees these guys sleeping, I don't hear it as though he's angry. I hear it as though he's heartbroken and discouraged and really feeling lonely because the people that were supposed to be the closest to him just aren't there. Man, the feelings of loneliness that you and I can probably only fathom. Oh my gosh. Loneliness. Jesus himself experienced that. He went off by himself to pray. Came back to these guys. This is just one small part of this text. This happened again. Jesus walked off again after he says this and went to go pray by himself. Again, and came back, and they fell asleep again. Now, there's a running joke in my house that um, if you really want me to get talking to you, tell me good night. <laughs> Those of you, yeah, that's it happens every time, right? And and that's just a joke in our house, but it happens for real. I understand Jesus' feelings of walking off and coming back to this because I do this all the time where, where I will walk off and I'll have a great thought that I must share, right? I must share this because it has to be, it has to be from God because it's brilliant, right? And when I come back out to the people who love me the most, who do life with me every day. They're snoring on the couch. And you're just like, oh. And I walk off and feel alone, feel lonely. 
Because who am I going to share this with? Do you understand that? I hope that makes sense. That's the weirdest analogy ever. But, but that's the idea here of what Jesus is experiencing. Loneliness internally because he's separated from others. They were there physically, but they weren't there. The connection was not happening. And so many times in our life, it's the very same thing. When we are experiencing difficulties, when we are experiencing loneliness, pulling away from others, or even having others pull away from us, because they start to get uncomfortable, they don't know how to help us through whatever we're dealing with, they don't know what to say, and so they begin to kind of drift as well. Not even in a hateful way. They still love us, they're just feeling awkward, so they would rather not be a part of it. And then we have the loneliness only to increase. Now here's the thing, get this, Jesus, the one and only Son of God, King of all kings that we just said about earlier, he had 12 really close disciples. 12. For the introverts in the room, 12 might be a couple too many. Can I get an amen? <laughs> right? You know what I'm talking about. Like, I don't want to go outside. It's too peopley out there. Right? So it's, the introverts are saying, that, that, that's plenty. Right? But Jesus, he had 12 really close ones. But get this. Those were just the close ones. Jesus had people everywhere. He was followed every single day by crowds. By crowds. The, the story of the scriptures say they fed 5,000 in one day. 5,000. People, as far as the eye could see. That was Jesus. Everybody is hearing about Jesus. Everybody knows who this Jesus guy is. There's always, always, always a line to see him. And you're telling me he's experiencing loneliness? Yeah. I sure am. Those of you that have your smartphones, pull them out. If you don't have your smartphone, that's okay. If you got Facebook, pull up your Facebook. I'm going gonna, I'm, I'm gonna to prove this point. This is going to be awesome. In my mind. Okay. Pull up Facebook. And when you've got your Facebook app open, I want you to go and tell me out loud, how many Facebook friends do you have? How many Facebook friends do you have? Just holler it out. Don't, don't be shy. There's no judgment here. You say two? Two. Okay. That might have thrown the illustration off, Mike, but we still love it. I love it, man. I love it. Somebody else, how many Facebook friends do you have? 262. 172. 262. 262. 262. Love Facebook. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. Well, we're going we're gonna to lay hands on you later and pray for you so you can have some friends. Uh, no, I'm teasing. I'm teasing. How, one more, couple more people. Facebook friends. 62. 62. 499. Yes, 499. Okay. That sounds like it's a back of auction year. <laughs> I have 1,363. Okay? That's not a bragging thing. Don't hear that. Please. I win. I am competitive, but this is not a game I'm trying to win. Right? 1,363. The way we often think about being friends with people, having people around us, I should never feel alone. I've got 1,363 friends just on Facebook. And I experience loneliness often, just like you, because we all do. It's not about the number. Jesus had 12, Jesus had 5,000, Jesus had immeasurable amounts of people, and yet he's experiencing loneliness. I want to share this with you, uh, I think. Yes, this is uh, from the Harley Therapy Counseling blog. It said, it's a myth to think that having many friends means you aren't lonely. Loneliness is less about quantity and more about a lack of quality interaction of the sort that leaves us feeling connected, 
valued and able to value. So as we talk today, this idea of being separated from others, I don't want you to freak out. And especially those of you who are more introverted, right? This, we're not telling you that you have to go get more friends. We're not telling you that at all. And if you go get more friends, then the loneliness will go away. We are not saying that. What we are saying is you need to be connected with quality people. Because even if it's two, two is better than 2,002 that just exist. Two quality friends can help you through loneliness more than 2,000 friends who just are there and being lonely. So when we talk about separation from others, this is not your command to go gather all the people of Lincoln, Lincoln and meet them all, right? We're just saying you need to be connected with real close people. Now here's the third point I want to make, separation from self. Separation from self. You ever heard the phrase or the statement, the idea that you need to know yourself intimately? Like you need to know who you are. You need to know how you're wired. You need to know how you respond in, in, in certain circumstances or situations. You, you need to know how, what your thought processes typically are and how you work through difficulties or circumstances. Um, there, there is something now that they call emotional intelligence. You've ever heard of emotional intelligence? Old school was they would give you an IQ test because they would say if your IQ is high, then you must be really, really smart and you're going to be an amazing leader and we're going to put you in charge of stuff. What they found out was that that is wrong, drastically wrong. Some of you have had that supervisor with a high IQ and you know what that was like. Amen? <laughs> Your boss isn't listening. You've been retired for 15 years. <laughs> Emotional intelligence. They call it your EQ. Your IQ is pretty static. You can't do anything about it. It is what it is. But your emotional intelligence is a skill. And how can I deal with people better? How can I deal with myself better? And all emotional intelligence means is when I'm dealing, when I'm stuck in my emotions, can I handle it? Do I know what it really is? The way, you, one of the ways you can tell if your emotional intelligence is high are the vocabulary words that you describe how you're feeling. If you're always just sad, or mad, or glad, and those are like the three words that you can come up with, you probably don't, you're not really in tune with what you're dealing with inside. You, Emotional intelligence needs work. And that's what all of us have to do because we got to know who Jesus created us to be. We have to know. And if we don't know ourselves well inside and out, we're not sure how to respond when things come. We're not sure if we're making the right decisions or not. We're not sure if we're stepping into the purpose that God has for each one of us because we don't know who we are. And when we don't know who we are, we start getting separated from ourselves because we have the us that's real and the us we think we are, and there's a tension because they are often very much so different. You want to think of it as it's the way that God created us to be and the mask that you wear everywhere you go. Or maybe you feel pressure all the time to be somebody that somebody else thinks you should be. And so you walk through life kind of pretending. And when we do that, loneliness compounds. Because we're, in a sense, arguing with our self. Right? Now there is scripture to back this up because we have an Elijah. Elijah was a prophet in the Old Testament. And I want to encourage you uh, in these days, go home and read from 1 Kings chapter 17 through chapter 19. It's an amazing thing taking place there. And you could see that, uh, that, that Elijah was a basket case. He truly was. And that's not an insult. That's who he was. He was wrestling with all of these very things. Elijah was a prophet called by God. 
And I love Elijah because because he was cocky. That's how that's how I see Elijah cocky. Um, I, we were talking about this this morning, so I'm going to go there. Do not hit me with rocks and sticks. The Browns have Baker Mayfield as quarterback. I know that doesn't sit well with some of the Huskers because he was a suitor. But as long as he throws touchdowns from Cleveland, I don't care. Right? <laughs> but Baker Mayfield is, can be, has been described at time or two as, as arrogant. But he delivered Right? He made it happen. And so Elijah's the same thing. Elijah got cocky when he was with what they called the prophets of Baal because they were going to burn. They were going to have a fire and make the rain happen and all these great things. And Elijah's standing there just leaning up against the wall going, bring the wood. Throw it in there. Go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. Your God will do it. No big deal. Go ahead. You know, pour some water on it. How about some more water? And Elijah's just taunting. And he's telling them, yeah, let, let's see if this can really happen. And, and so they kept pouring water on it. And he's like, okay, go ahead and call out to your God. Let's see what happens. And of course, nothing happened. Elijah calls upon the Almighty God, and fire comes from heaven. Not only does it light wood on fire, which is possible, but remember, they just doused it with water after water after water. And Elijah's like, how you doing? That's my God, right? So Elijah has this mountaintop experience. I mean, this is good stuff. You get to be used by God, and a miracle takes place right in front of your very eyes. I have to imagine somebody high-fived the God when it was all taking place. So Elijah is up here on this mountaintop, and then something happens. It's in our text. Ahab, who was the king, the evil king, told Jezebel everything. Now, get this, there's a reason we don't, you know, Bible names are very popular. Peter, John, Paul, <laughs> the Beatles. Um, anyway, um, there's no ring though, but you get what I'm saying. There's a reason none of us named our daughters Jezebel. Okay? So, the wicked king Ahab, Jezebel, who is, you know, for sake of argument, even worse. Jezebel, everything Elijah had done, and how he had killed all the prophets with the sword. So referring to this mountaintop experience that Elijah just had. And so Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah to say, may the gods deal with me, be it ever so severely, if by this time tomorrow I do not make your life like that one of them. Now that's a very poetic way to say I'm going to kill him. That's what Elijah just experienced here. So mountaintop, I'm going to kill you. What happens next? Elijah was afraid and ran for his life. When he came to Beersheba in Judah, he left his servant there while he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness. He came to a broom bush sat down under it and prayed that he might die. Dear God, kill me now. Amen. I've had enough, Lord, he said. Take my life. I'm no better than my ancestors who got it wrong all the time. Then he laid down under the bush and fell asleep. Did Elijah forget who he was? One statement from one person caused him to totally be separated from himself. God just used him in ways that have not been seen since. And yet this one statement by somebody caused him to make himself be physically separate and be apart from everybody else and physically be alone, but internally going, this is it. I'm, I'm done. I'm all alone. I'm feeling miserable because somebody said something to him and it caused him to forget who God created him to be. 
It caused him to forget the very calling that God had placed on his life. It caused him to just simply forget that God was with him just a little bit ago and was still going to be with him down the road. He just simply forgot all of that and was separated from his true self in the midst of it. And that is what loneliness will and can do. I would make the argument that Elijah had low emotional intelligence. Right? Because he was wrestling with something inside, and his first response wasn't, is this real? Is this a legit emotion, or am I just kind of in my feelings for a minute? No, he's like, oh, this stinks. I want to die. Right? So that's, that's, again, a sign of some low emotional intelligence, a skill he might need to work on. Right? But that's what Elijah is experiencing right now. One person said one thing, sent him over the edge. And all of a sudden, he is in loneliness like never before. I would also make the argument here that just maybe Elijah was prideful. Because he was on the mountaintop. He was making fun of the prophets of Baal. God used him to bring fire down. God used him to bring rain when there hadn't been rain for years. Yeah, that's good stuff. And you can start to think really, really highly about yourself because just as much as you can talk down to yourself and ignore who God created you to be, you can create yourself into something that you aren't either. And so that's why knowing yourself is so vitally important because it creates loneliness and difficult situations. Knowing yourself. Do not separate from yourself exactly how God created you to be. I don't know what you're wrestling with today, but I'm going to tell you this. Each one of you are made exactly as God intended. Every one of you. There's nothing wrong with you. You don't have to become like somebody else. Again, I'll go back to the introvert thing. There was a, there was a lady in our life in Kansas City probably one of the most introverted people I've ever met. And I'm married to Jennifer. Right? <laughs> Jennifer's pretty introverted. So we've been married now for 20 years. I've had a lot to learn because in case you don't know, I'm not, I'm not introverted. I don't get it. It doesn't make any sense to me. But I see introverts so often wishing they weren't. Oh, I wish I could stand on the platform and talk to people like that. I wish I could do that. No, don't. God made you on purpose for a purpose. And if we were all extroverts, church service will never end. <laughs> so be who you are. Step into it. Embrace it. If you are somebody who's really organized, there's a reason for that. Because God needs you to be that. Because you're going to serve the kingdom in some way, shape, or form with that, right? On, on down the line, however God made you is on purpose. There's nothing wrong with you. But you have to embrace it, own it, and figure out what his purpose for you in that design really is, okay? So here's how we want to close today. Homework, because that's what we do in a good class. There is homework, all right? Here's the first piece for your homework. Evaluate your relationship with Jesus. Evaluate your relationship with Jesus. And if you don't have one, then we got to start there. First and foremost, you may be struggling with loneliness today and hoping and praying that there's a, a simple fix or a couple of steps you can do, some changes you can make to your schedule or your life or whatever. But I'm telling you, without Jesus, you can do nothing. Without Jesus, you can do nothing. Jesus and Jesus Christ alone is where you must start your relationship with Jesus. Do you have one? If not, we want to pray with you and help you to get that relationship, to lead you in that. There's no magical prayer to pray. There's no certain word you have to say in order for it to take. But if your heart is sincere, Jesus Christ will meet you right there and become the Lord of your life. If you're online with us today and you're watching on Facebook live stream, private messages, put something in the comments. Do whatever you need to do. If you need a relationship with Jesus Christ today, we will help you with that and answer whatever questions you 
by half. But what is your relationship like with Jesus? Maybe for some of you today, you know, you accepted Christ a long time ago. You've been a Christian for a long, long time. But your relationship really hasn't grown. It hasn't gotten deeper. It hasn't gotten stronger. Maybe church at 1030 on Sunday morning is kind of it. That's just what it looks like for you. Maybe you've been caught up in the circumstances of life and you've slowly drifted away from Christ and that intimacy that you, that you once had. Again, that's not condemnation. That's my encouragement for you to come to Jesus. See, we don't, we, we don't come to Jesus to get church service. We don't come to Jesus to get potluck dinners in the fellowship hall. We don't, we, we, don't, we don't come to Jesus to sing songs. We come to Jesus to get Jesus. Because if all the other stuff went away, it doesn't matter. We still got Jesus. All we want is him. And so what is your relationship with Christ like? There's hope. There's forgiveness in Jesus. What is that relationship like? Second thing, engage in authentic community. Engage in authentic community. I know that Zoom is awful. I know that. When this COVID thing hit before we were able to move here, uh, my poor family had to suffer because I was in every room of the house all the time on Zoom meetings, sometimes seven meetings a day on Zoom. And what many people began to discover just a few months into that was that, man, I am exhausted. I haven't left my house. How am I exhausted? It's because of Zoom, right? It just it's, it can be mentally draining. That sounds awful, but here's the thing. You don't have to be on seven meetings a day and be on Zoom. But I want to encourage you to be on Zoom. Don't let the technology scare you away. Don't let your preference for Zoom or not Zoom scare you away. If the only way that you can engage in authentic community is on Zoom, then do something rather than do nothing. Because if you're doing nothing, the, the loneliness that's brewing inside of you is only going to get worse. But get connected with community. Get connected with people. Engage in it. Even if it's just once a week for a few minutes, but engage in authentic community. You know we can still engage one another even in the midst of a pandemic. It might look different, but we can still engage one another. We can still see each other. We can still call one another on the phone. We can still shoot a text. We can still get together and, and, and pray for one another. Be intentional about engaging with the people that you're closest to. If it's safe for you and if it's possible, just meet up now and again and go get coffee. Go get lunch together. Go do something like that. Right? Did you know that Bagels and Joe, right up the street here, is full every day? Because people are engaging in authentic community. There were a lot of people at Scooters yesterday. Right? People are engaging in authentic community all over the place. You can do that too. Pray for one another. Talk about what God is doing in your life. That's what authentic community looks like. And I want to share, a, for lack of a better term, an announcement with you. I'm excited about this. It's going to be kind of vague because all the details aren't worked out. But this idea of engaging in an authentic community is something I believe in strongly. And that's why in 2021, hopefully at the beginning of the year, we will be launching our small group ministry. Because I believe in authentic community. Life change happens in the context of relationships. Life change happens in the context of relationships. And some of you may go, man, we, I did that small group thing once. And that was, you know, we read a book and we went home. Well, I, I just want to say this, uh, that, that you can do small group ministry in many different ways. Some are more effective than others. Your experience may be different. But here's what I want to tell you about. I believe in the ABCDs of small group ministry. The A stands for accountability. Right? We aren't just getting together to hang out and read a book and, and maybe eat a meal together. We're holding each other accountable. Hey, you said last week you were struggling with this. How you doing? Hey, you, you said you were going to start reading your Bible every morning at 7 a.m. How you doing? 
right? Accountability, because I don't know about you, but if I don't got somebody watching over me now and again, I'll drift off and end up on Twitter for a couple hours, okay? So it's, it's possible. Accountability, B, a place to belong. Authentic community means I belong somewhere. I'm not tolerated somewhere. I, I, I belong somewhere. These are my people, right? These are people I know that love me and care for me and wanna, wanna do life with me, I belong. C is care, C is care. They're gonna actually check on me. They're actually gonna pray for me in my sickness or my upcoming surgery, or, or they're gonna go check on me when I'm, when I'm in the hospital, I can know that if nobody else remembers, my small group cares for me because that's what authentic community does. And then D is discipleship. Discipleship, helping one another to grow into the image and likeness of Jesus Christ. Authentic community, all of that happening at one time because loneliness is real and God has a better plan for it, okay? So I wanted to share that with you today. And then uh, here, examine your inner self. Is our third piece of homework for you. Let's share this scripture from Psalm. This is Psalm 139. It says, Search me, God, and know my heart. By the way, dangerous prayer to pray, but very effective if you will allow God to do his thing in your life. Search me, God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there's any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. God, look at me and help me discover, first off, who you created me to be. Who am I? What is this stuff going on inside me? Right? If there are anxious thoughts, God, if there's things in my life that need to go away and be replaced with something greater from you, let me know. And God, look at me. Help me to know me so that I can walk away from all the stuff that you don't have for me and head into the life of everlasting and head your direction for me, right? So examine your inner self. And then my fourth point is this, explore professional counsel. Explore professional counsel. You can have Jesus and a therapist too. I'm gonna say that till Jesus tells me to stop. Explore professional counsel came to me and your arm was broken, I would recommend you go to a doctor. And we don't bat an eye about that. But if you're struggling mentally, your brain might be broken. Let's go see a doctor. Someone that God has gifted. Someone that God is using. Somebody whose pay grade is way up there because they know what they're doing and they know what they're talking about and they can help you with that broken brain or just broken thought processes that you've been stuck in your whole life and can't seem to, to find a way to get out of. Explore professional counseling. Do not be ashamed. Know that you can come to me at any time and I will encourage you in that. I don't care anybody else tells you in your life about professional counseling. It is okay to have Jesus and a therapist too. In fact, my new friends that I got to meet last week at, uh, at Nebraska Strong Recovery Project, I mentioned this last week, I've got cards if you want them. If you need to come to me privately because you may be a little shy about all that, just come see me in my home. I'll get you the cards. But these folks are connected with a lot of people that can offer resources and offer you help with things like this. Do not be ashamed of it. There's nothing, you're, you're, not, you're not wrong. You just need some help. And we want to connect you with that help if you're battling loneliness today. You may have come to church today and go, man, I was really hoping to be encouraged. Uh, I was hoping for a happy message and he's talking about loneliness. But you know what? It's real. And we all experience it. And we have to learn how to deal with it and cope with it if we want to get to the next step of life. Because it's going to come again. And if we can master it back here, will make it easier the next time as we come back. Jesus was lonely. Don't be shy. Don't be ashamed. You and our spirits of loneliness too. Pray with me. God, today we are thankful. <clears throat> We're thankful to know that you know what it's like to be us. 
God, we're thankful that you showed us how we can cope with holiness. We're thankful, God, that in the midst of our pain, in the midst of our emotions and our feelings, you're there because you promised to never leave us or forsake us. And so, God, for anyone in this room, anybody who's watching online that, that is really battling with loneliness right now, first thing, let them know you are there. In the midst of it all, even if all the other friends and family have left them and are like your disciples were, asleep on the side somewhere, let them know that you are there in the midst of that grief, in the midst of that struggle, in the midst of that pain. God, help us as a body of Christ to truly be connected with one another and to help each other experience authentic community. Raise up those, Lord, amongst us who are the exact people you've created for this time, who can be a source of encouragement, who can refer to their own struggles and how they got through for the ones that are struggling today. God, may this place be a place where loneliness begins to be shattered because it's a tool of the enemy to keep us away from you and to keep us from the life that you intend. God, help this to be a place that can take back what hell had stolen. And it's a place where the lonely can find peace, where the lonely can find comfort, and where the lonely can find connection. God, have your way in us. Heal us, we pray. Restore us, we pray. It's your name we pray. Amen. diligently uh, and sometimes ad nauseum since, uh, since I arrived about two and a half months ago is getting our uh, church website updated, recreated, 
uh, and, and, and even more effective, not only in reaching our community, but in enabling you to be able to communicate with us too. And so I'm happy to say that uh, our new website is up. Our new, yeah, you can clap, it's okay. <laughs> I want to share with you the domain name has changed. We have a new website address, and it is fellowshiplincoln.com. The reason we did that is because it's a lot shorter to say than the old one was. That's really all, that's really all it boiled down to. Um, and when your church name has fellowship in it, that's already a long word. There's a lot of syllables in that. And so trying to find a way that we can condense that and make it easier for everybody. So fellowshiplincoln.com. That is the homepage behind me. It'll look a lot better when you pull it up on your phone or on your computer at home. But fellowshiplincoln.com. There are still things that have to be added. For example, you'll notice that we don't have children's ministry and youth ministry on the website currently. And that is just simply because we're rebuilding those ministries. And so we, are, as soon as we finish rebuilding those ministries, we'll know what to say about it and put them on the website. Uh, we have online giving that is now available on the website. Um, and uh, we are going to be working with Alice Ann, who is our treasurer, uh, so, that, so that she can begin to be comfortable with her role and what all of that means uh, and how to keep track of all that stuff. And we're, we've tested it a few times to make sure it works. Uh, you'll also notice on the website that you can text to give. Um, that is available is now. So if you wanted to give $20, you text 20 to this phone number and it gives. Okay? So that is available for you as well. Email addresses have officially changed too. Because one of the reasons we wanted to change the website and the domain name is because we wanted uh, the, the staff and some leaders here in the church to have an email address at our domain name. So, for example, mine is Smith at fellowshiplincoln.com. That is my new official email address. Uh, we will have one that says office at fellowshiplincoln.com and so on and so on. So that information is on there. Um, and again, please feel free to check it out. Uh, let us know if we have a typo, because I hate typos. And I tried to catch them all, but just in case I missed, let us know. Um, and if you have questions or concerns about anything, feel free to reach out to me. Uh, we want, we want to uh, hear that from you. And, and see how we can continue to make things better. So that is a task that is completed. Thank you, church, for your faithfulness and your giving that has allowed this to become a reality. Because it's not just the website that functions with this. For us to help lead and for our leaders in the church, we have a multitude of resources that are available to us that we're going to be continuing to roll out that are all connected to this. This is a, this is a good day to be a part of Fellowship Community Church because good things are happening uh, around us and in us and through us. The second thing we want to talk about today, because today, again, is a day of celebration. We're excited about all the stuff that has happened, is happening, and is coming. And I want to invite uh, our chairman, Mr. Don Edwards. Uh, Don Edwards is our, the chair of our board. You can come on up, Don. I'm going to give Don a mic stand. He can talk to you, but but uh, our brother Don has a very special uh, presentation announcement, uh, surprise, celebration, and any other adjectives you would like to use right now. He has that just for us. So Don, would you lead us, please? Hi, Don. I'm sure a blue mark on the floor here. I see my special stand. You can. <laughs> hey, good morning, everyone. This is a great, great day. Would all the board members please come forward? Is this on? Yes, sir. Okay, I'm good to go. And would Pastor George and Lena Jean also come forth? Come on. This is like prices are right. Come on down. <laughs> Pastor, I don't know. When you ask about what is on my iPhone, I have no Facebook. <laughs> but I have a picture of all my tractors. <laughs> <laughs> and I can talk to my tractors and they don't talk back. <laughs> they do need some help. They do need some help, yes, they do need some help. Yes, yes. 
As we have, and many of you have been asking, how can we say thank you to Pastor George and Leonard Jean for all the years of service they have provided to us? Well, we haven't been able to come up with very good ideas and thoughts. And of course, this whole pandemic has really created some problems. So we have thought of many a thing, you know, put up a big tent and have a celebration outside, have something catered. No, no, no. Well, Vicki, you did very well. You at least got us uh, all lined up and we had a drive-by. But two weeks ago, our board met and said, we need to do something even better because I don't know what it is, but let's try. So the board did go uh, uh, come together and we understand that also a little consultation with Anderson, headquarters of the Church of God, that they have indicated that when a pastor retires, they should, and with his spouse, they should just go get lost for six months at a minimum, preferably a year, and rejuvenate and then come back. And we thought, hmm, maybe there's an idea here. What do they like to do when they're away? They like to travel. Well, we could stick them on a cruise ship and send them over somewhere. They could probably spend six months in a port, isolated. <laughs> <laughs> we could stick them on a plane to a country somewhere, probably sit there for six months in a hotel, isolated. So we decided, no, let's let them decide where they would like to travel. And so on behalf of the board, Here's Ed. Ed, would you present to them a gift card that they can choose where they want to go? And in that gift card is a bit of a gift of says this. Now we ask you, brothers and sisters, to acknowledge those who work hard among you, who care for you in the Lord, and who admonish you. Hold them in the highest regard, in love, because of their work. And then 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 17 says, the elders who direct the affairs of the church well are worthy of double honor especially those whose work is preaching and teaching. And I want, to, I want to say publicly how thankful I am for your decades of work, faithful service, and love for this church. Because of you and because of how God has used you, we are able to step into the future because you prepared the way. And we are so thankful for that today. And we love you. And we want to honor you better than a hand clap. It's what we got right now. But you're going to get bombarded, I'm sure, out in the lobby when we're done. Because we truly do want you to receive double honor. We are thankful for you. This church is thankful for you. This community is thankful for you. And we love you dearly. Kudos to you. Again, please, please continue. Yes, we gave them a gift. Yes, we honored them. And uh, yes, we had the drive-by card thing for the retirement. But you know what? They deserve more. They deserve more. So please feel free. You are dismissed. Go say hello. Go congratulate them. Go thank them. And uh, we will see you.